Rabies and Germs, welcome to the Mishmash Podcast. My name is McConaughey, I'm here with Scott Moore, and for today's edition, we'll be sharing our thoughts on Rick and Morty. For the uninitiated, Rick and Morty is an adult animated science fiction created by Justin Roiland, who also voices the titular characters in the show, and Dan Harmon. Showing on Cartoon Network's late night adult swim block, the series began in December 2nd, 2013, and concluded its third season on October 1st, 2017, with a fourth season sure to come in the future. The series originated from a Back to the Future parody spoof called The Adventures of Doc and Marty, and when Harmon was approached by Cartoon Network for ideas, he and Roiland came together to create Rick and Morty. The series follows the misadventures of the cynical mad scientist Rick Sanchez and his easily manipulated and dim-witted grandson, Morty Smith, in their time spent together between domestic life and interdimensional adventures. The series has received widespread critical acclaim from critics and viewers alike, with many citing its creativity and originality as highlights for the series. First question is probably, how high on drugs do you think these creators were? There's definitely, like, and I think it's um, part of the reason they're able to capture this kind of fluid randomness is because it has so much improv in it. Like, a lot of it's just them making it up on the spot. Like, So what it reminds me of is that two, like, stoners were sitting on a couch watching Back to the Future, because it's clearly where yeah, the definitely... initial idea came from. So you're sitting there with your feet propped up, joint hanging out of your mouth, you're about to fall asleep, and all of a sudden you're like, Rick and Morty. And that's where <laughs> it just all comes together. And you're like, I'm going to make this crazy-haired doctor, and he's going to start traveling through time, and he's also going to have a boy sidekick. Should we give him a floating skateboard? No, that's too much. So they took out the floating skateboard, but they decided to create Rick and Morty, which I, I think they had to have been doing a lot of extracurricular I, activities I before they so. did I this. think so. Like, because I think you and I both have like a very, like with our writing at some points, we can go in very, very random directions. It's just like, if you just... If you're like, let's do something weird, and then, like, you don't control yourself or keep yourself in the conventions of what is, like, established formula, and I think that's what they do, is a lot of the times they go in a completely different direction. It's kind of like how they approach the show, I feel like. It's kind of like Seinfeld, where Seinfeld kind of advertised itself as the show about nothing, and whereas this show kind of enforces the idea that nothing matters through and through. The first episode, though, if you recall... I mean, the first episode is uh, Rick going to blow up the world in a neutrino bomb. Uh, Morty talks him out of it. But they still go to this uh, planet, and I don't recall what the planet is called off the top of my head. They go to this planet, and he wants to collect these seeds. And he literally makes uh, Morty shove them into his rectal <laughs> cavity so that way they can get through security. How is that not the first episode? Is a pure cocaine over-the-border reference. So, I mean, you have to think that they at least have some connection... Uh, to to these drugs, or that they're at least thinking about them as they're doing it. They just jump right out the gates into the drug references. And it was a more adult-oriented uh, TV show. And and that first episode, it really got me. I, I don't know that I was hooked after that first episode. <laughs> and if I, if I hadn't heard about it for so long, and I hadn't started... Actually, I didn't even start watching until, what, the end of season three... Um, yeah, that that was already started, started watching till like season three was just about at its end. It ended like early October. Uh, yeah, October first, two thousand seventeen. And I don't, I don't know. I I've heard about the show forever. Is I've had friends that have recommended I've it. I've seen T shirts and posters. I've, I've heard a lot of things. And like even years before this, I have been like there is this running tradition where I buy uh, my older brother Michael. Uh, Rick and Morty every year, or something Rick and Morty oriented. Like, uh, a few years back, I bought him Rick and Morty Season 1. A year later for Christmas, I bought him Rick and Morty Season 2. This year, I can't buy him Rick and Morty Season 3 because it's not coming out until around March on DVD. But I've got him something else that's Rick and Morty uh, related. And I trust that I'm not going to spoil his Christmas present because I don't see him listening to our podcast. <laughs> but, but, yeah, he it's a tradition. He may be listening. I mean, he... You know, works at a factory. He's got eight long hours. Maybe he's popping up our podcast on his YouTube, which you guys can do too by liking and subscribing and following our channel with the notifications. But he's probably sitting there listening to Rick and Morty's reviews because he really likes Rick and Morty. He hasn't seen season three yet. So maybe we'll do like anytime we do a season three uh, speech, we'll just, you know, yell spoiler right before it. So that way he knows. <laughs> That's it. You don't listen to this part. You skip forward maybe about a minute and 30 seconds until inevitably we're off on another tangent talking about something entirely different. And you had the belief, like, and I think we both share this belief that 
season three is the best season so far, and you thought by far. I think season three is by far the best. Season one was okay. I, I didn't hate season one. I'm sorry, sorry. Season one was okay. I didn't hate season one by any means. Scary Terry was in season one, <laughs> and I just love that one. Mr. Meeseeks? Mr. Meeseeks. Um, you can run, but you can't hide. Turns out you can hide. <laughs> he's very depressed. The end of that one, they're smoking a joint, too. So there you go. Did that, you notice... Uh, that's this... the first two episodes, back to back, that they're drug references. Did you notice the end, the change in the ending scene on season one and two from season three? How it's like... Do you, I don't know if you remember how it ends every time. Like the, it's a good show. Yeah. And there's the... Uh, in the first two seasons, there's... A man and a woman sitting on a couch, and it's like with their cats and their animals and all that stuff, and it's like the ending credit thing. Yeah. It's just like a picture. In season three, it's just that guy by himself with the cats because it's the creator got a divorce. And in season three, <laughs> I did not realize the creator got a divorce. Three, so he took out his wife and yeah. kids, and he's like, sorry, just me and the cat now. <laughs> Which, I mean, is really depressing, but also. Kind of I'm pretty funny. sure he has like a sad look on his face, too. So I'm not gonna lie. Like I, season three, I did not watch it on TV, so there was so I had to figure out a way to watch it, and so I YouTube watched it through reaction videos. You know how hard it is to try to get into a show while somebody else is reacting to the oh my God. Uh, the same show that you're trying to watch. He's like, oh my God, this is the greatest part. I'm like, oh my God, shut up! I'm trying to listen to what's going on so I can talk about it later on my own YouTube show. <laughs> so so that that's what that's how I watched season three. Um, I was immersed though in the entire time. Season two was really good though. I think see, I think uh, it goes in progression. I mean, season one I, was okay. I have, I'm on the fence about uh, because like I'm a little foggy on because I I watch them all in rapid uh, succession, so it's difficult to identify which one happened in season one, which one happened in season two, uh, and I don't have necessarily a favorite episode. Uh, I have a least favorite episode, and I'm convinced that it's my least favorite episode, is the in interdimensional TV, the second season's one. <laughs> I like those ones. The, like... the first season was cool, and then it just kind of, like, now you just, it's like, it's gone overboard. That one was a little, I don't know, it didn't do it for me. My favorite moments, like, that I can distinguish about the series, I've got two. My favorite moment was in the, uh... The flu dance uh, episode. Yeah, okay. The so episode where, where it Morty. ends with uh, them burying their uh, like their future self, not future self. That's the Cronenberg episode. Yeah, the Cronenberg episode. And I remember like that scene, and like as uh, Morty walks over to the couch, his eyes are huge, and it's just like that. W and I think that's the first episode I ever saw of the series because I remember that's the episode where Morty kind of gives up on life. Yeah, <laughs> because I remember whenever I first was introduced to the series before I started to watch it all. Like, someone recommended it to me, and they're like, hey, you gotta watch this, and they showed me this episode, this was the episode they singled out, and, yeah, that's a really cool moment. Um, so, what I, what I like about that is, on the first season, you didn't see it as much, but in the second season, because, I don't know, if I want to equate it to, like, a show that I've watched previously, the first season was more like a family guy, not in the exact, in the content, or the way that the, uh, the aesthetic view was, but in the kind of sense that it was all over the place and there was really no build-up between characters and everything kind of just happened from episode to episode. But as you progress into, like, the end, after that episode, when Morty stops just, like, giving up, and you can see that, and then all the way to the end of season one, which is, like, the episode where uh, Rick ends up going to prison. He ends up giving himself up. The end of season one is, uh, no, the end of season two is that. Is, is that, the is him yes, being, yes you're yeah. right and, and that's my second one is that's my second favorite or that's act one of the other two things that's my favorite thing is whenever he gets locked up and it's like well, the season one's the freezing episode isn't it the yeah. with the parents they freeze them and the, that they have the big uh party at the end of that okay yeah yeah you're right yeah. uh and because uh, I remember the end of that whenever he's locked up and then the guy over to him's like what are you in for and he's like everything and it was just a really cool moment and that's actually one of the uh, unfortunate aspects about it is it's not really... It's kind of a criticism, but I guess it goes with the flow of the show where it's supposed to have this mindset that life doesn't matter. And there's a line in it that Morty says that like uh, really captures the elements of it where life is meaningless, blah, 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 we all die. And no one that. exists uh, on purpose. Yeah, no one exists on purpose. Come here and watch TV. And 
And that really captures the essence of what the show is trying to uh, get across. But still, at the end of season two, I feel like I was really, really, like, hyped up. And then the start of season three, it's, uh, he's, like, out. He's, like... <laughs> or not he's not that he's out, actually. It was... Uh, you think he is. Yeah. At the beginning of it, you think he is because he's sitting in the... Uh, the diner or the cafe <laughs> with the bug that is from the intergalactic, and you think that, oh man, he just got out, and that's cheap. It's not. He makes it's. It's still. I still feel like it's kind of cheap, honestly. It's... I feel like he outsmarted it. I mean, he really. I mean, he's like the smartest person in the universe, or the smartest creature in the universe. So to have him outsmarted by this simulation would have been kind of lackluster. So that he was able to outsmart it, I think, was a really good transition into his the rest of the season where he was showing who he was and maybe he did it all on purpose because he was able to get in there and get what he wanted. So it kind of keeps that idea that maybe Rick Sanchez is untouchable. Um, one other thing as well that's unique about this show, I think, or at least is worth singling out, is how bizarre the voice acting is. Where it's, it's uh, Justin Roiland doing the voice of Rick and Morty, uh, as said earlier. And it's very, very loose, like, casual and relaxed with the voice acting. Like, he's, at some point, and I actually like it because it feels less perfect. Like, every, like, normally whenever you have a show, everyone says their lines perfectly. And it seems like in this show, he'll, like, stutter or he'll, like, mess up the line. And then he'll continue to go or forward. Or burp right or in the middle burp. of it. <laughs> like, and he's just, it just seems very, very relaxed. And it, se it feels... Un, I mean, imperfect, and that's kind of not uh, unique about it. Um, so if if I say that what my favorite thing about the show is, is Rick, it's definitely Rick. <laughs> I mean, it's got to be because no other, every other character has the basis of Rick. Like no one adapts to anything, no one does anything. Nothing happens except for Rick's amusement. Like Rick controls everything. It, it, and it's, it's like in the palm of his hand. And, and like at one point, whenever you were watching it, you said. He's my spirit animal, and it's and it kind of is exactly how I felt as well because he's and if not necessarily how I see life, it's how like in my head I know it is, and it's so whenever I think about it because I hate whenever people get on that high horse and say like this show is so smart you got to be smart to watch it no I feel like anybody can watch it we're not yeah, doing quantum it's... mechanics, I mean like I said Schrodinger's cat kind of threw me off. I had to think about it for a second. I went to psychology school. I had to, you know, like, think about, okay, how in the world is he using this in this context? And then I got it. Aha, funny. But that was really the only thing that threw me off. But I do think that you have to have some kind of cynicism in your it's, head to make it is. funny. I mean, but you got to think about it. If you look at today's world and society, we have a lot of things that I'm not going to get into here, but that I don't agree with, and a lot of things that scare me. And a lot of situations where I'm just like, you know, what is the point of any of this? Or I sit there and I think in my, you know, 40-hour-a-week job, which, I mean, I don't hate my job, but if if I had to choose whether I was rich and didn't go to work or whether I went to my 40-hour-a-week job, I would definitely choose to be rich. So I sometimes think, and I get cynical, and I sit down and I think, Rick is just me acting out without any bounds like he's me with no bounds i think it's even more so I mean, less than cynicism it's a he solved his own ex existential crisis like he's no longer wondering about like his meaning to life he's discovered that there simply he's is no given up he's like it's not <laughs> it's the epitome feel, of giving it up it doesn't even feel like cynicism it's like it's apathy it's like this feeling of just like whatever and like throughout the thing you'll see all these things happening and you'll look at him and he's just got a, like a normal like and it's funnily enough how i tell everyone to live their life when they ask me they're like are you happy or you're sad i'm like i'm here and that's really what it is and that's why i always say Rick is my spirit animal because he's like, are you happy or are you sad? And you're just like, well, I'm here. That's 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 the best I could do. Let's do what we can with that because there's nothing else that you can possibly change or possibly do about it. So be the best you can. I mean, in Rick's world, you have what he says. Uh, I could replace anybody because there's, uh, <laughs> you yeah. know, an indefinite number of people. So who who cares? Like, and there's... there's there's like some speculation as well. And I think that I, whenever I was talking about whenever we did our discussion over the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I said something along the lines of, whereas both of these shows, like they have aspects of seriousness, like um, like with Marvel, it has some aspects of seriousness. I've seen like Civil War, and it feels like. 
But overall, they're very, very... I wouldn't say lightheart, but I kind of would say lightheart, because although they deal with serious subject matter, like, Rick and Morty deals with subject, not serious subject matter in a very carefree manner. They definitely manner. take the edge out of it. Like, uh, they defang everything you're afraid of. And uh, likewise with uh, Marvel, I feel like whenever you have moments of, like, humanity sprinkled in, it means more because of the times you've had without it. Like, right. for instance, whenever you have... In, uh, times where you see like maybe maybe rick does care a little bit about this morty or maybe he does care about this or care about uh like putting them first and you never and the thing is it never gives a definitive answer and on whether or not know. he does like i'm like I'm like does he because i'm like this is a special one episode like <laughs> whatever you think that he's like it, you know i'm in love with morty i love you morty and all the good stuff like oh that's the first episode of season three the section one episode where he he's uh Going and trying to get the sauce back, and like he goes back and he's like, Morty, I did this for you, I did this for everybody. Then at the end of the episode, he pushes Morty down. He's like, I didn't do it for you, I did it for the Szechuan sauce. <laughs> and you're like, I'm not sure that he didn't. I don't know. He may have done it for the Szechuan sauce, he may have done it for Morty. Who knows? Um, and there's a lot of theorizing about um, what this series will mean thereafter because there's a lot of subplots with evil Morty, what that means, whether or not. And there's like a there's theories regarding whether or not Evil Morty was originally the uh, original Morty. Yeah, because there's like a lot of things like they go. Uh, so do you think that this, that is the case? Because I mean, I have read that. There's I didn't some. Go into there's depth. some things like uh, at some point they give. Uh, whenever I think it's whenever he's locked up at the end of season two or something around that, he goes through his memories and he sees uh, Morty whenever he's a little kid, but it, that doesn't go with this universe's. Uh, Rick and Morty. They're yes, not supposed to have you can't ever tell that. who is who and where is where, except and are we even seeing the original Rick most of the time? I'm not and even sure. there's also a sequence whenever they are the dad's name. Uh, the dad's name. <laughs> why would you? Uh, why would you throw me out on that? Uh, uh, um, what is the dad's name? <laughs> well, regardless, uh, whenever they have. Uh, the dad, whenever he is in that daycare thing, where, like where they have them um, look after him, uh, in that sequence they show whenever they drop him off and he's filling out a application to sign him off. Um, it's gonna bother me that I don't know his name. Uh, Jerry Smith. Jerry. Jerry. Yeah. Jerry. Uh, <laughs> I mean, one of the best episodes in the series is a Jerry and Rick episode. <laughs> <laughs> where they go to the roller coaster and like it was one of the best ones and oh man I can't believe I forgot Jerry and you got Jerry World where they go to the Jerry Daycare Center yeah that's that that's stuff. actually what I was talking about is whenever they go to the Jerry Daycare Center and Rick is filling uh, filling out that application to like uh, to put him there he puts on his world and what world he's from but he doesn't put what world uh, Jerry's from he's he puts. Uh, like, in Dash A and all that stuff. Well, because, I mean, Jerry's not the original Jerry anyways. If yeah, you but, recall, because like, the Cronenberg was, episode. Yeah, but they, uh, like, he doesn't keep, it's like he doesn't keep track of the worlds he's in, but he would still know. And there's something else, too. Like, um, maybe it's something to do with Morty. Maybe he puts uh, puts Morty's name down there as well and puts a in Dash A for that. Uh, but they, they give a lot of evidence to suggest, perhaps, that they're not, the, I mean, it's not the original Morty. And that Rick's been doing this uh, jump in between thing for quite a while, and that's the theory is that Evil Morty is in fact the original Morty, right? Which is why I don't. I always find it odd because you're doing interdimensional time travel, which is, is is great. It's not time travel. Like Rick really specifically wants you to know that it's not time travel. It's just interdimension travel, and because there's that episode where he goes, it's not time travel, <laughs> and so. So you got the original Beth, and you got that's that's the mom, the original Beth, and the original Jerry. And in the episode of the Cronenberg, he leaves them behind, and he goes to these two new uh, Beth and Jerry's, but they're the exact same. So why is it that Beth and Jerry's are always the exact same, but Rick's aren't always the exact same? Morty's aren't always the exact same, but uh, Beth and Jerry's are always the exact same. He always tells them there's an indefinite number of you, but the indefinite number is always the same. So that that really bothered me, because like the fact of the matter is, it was like, is Beth, that episode where he allows Beth to go back into her imaginary place and uh, save that uh, guy she ends up killing him and realizes she's more like uh, Rick than she ever could imagine, and he's like, well, you don't want to be here, do you want to make a clone of you, or do you want to stay? And then she's like, am I a clone, Dad? 
you're not even the real Beth. So like, <laughs> so are you a clone of the fake Beth? Because the real Beth is muscular and in the Cronenberg world. So <laughs> well, not necessarily the real Beth, but the one that uh, at least the one we yeah. were introduced to at first. Yeah, and it's and it, it carries this idea that nothing matters, and it uh, that the only characters that really have any type of importance are Rick and Morty, respectively, and that and which is why I think that it's gonna like chip that away whenever it r- perhaps reveals that. Uh, Evil Morty is the original Morty. And Evil Morty's episode in the third season was the best episode probably in the entire series. It, in terms of dramatic, in terms of like world building, in terms of just seeing all that and knowing that that's going to culminate into something, I thought that would have been a better season three ending than the entire President Obama versus <laughs> Rick battle. I, I didn't hate that episode. I just thought it was a middle episode. I didn't think it was an ending episode. I thought it was a middle episode. Because if you think about it, wouldn't it have been far more dramatic to end on the close-up of the Rick or the Morty with the eye patch and him looking out the window and it fading in and then Mr. Poopy Butt coming up <laughs> and saying, Hello, everybody. I'm sorry I couldn't make a, an appearance this season. But I was busy making a family. But we'll come back to you with season four in a really, really long time. Like, I'm talking, I'm going to have a beard and well, babies. <laughs> so I, I thought that would have been a better way to end it rather than what felt to me like a throwaway episode. I find that whenever, as I watch this show, like, my concluding thoughts are, and not necessarily my thoughts on that particular episode is, and it's how I described it right after I finished the series, because as I said, like, there are people that have recommended the show to me, like, repeatedly, but whenever I concluded my thoughts, I thought to myself, like, this show, as I watch it, makes me feel like the best is yet to come. Like, it's building towards something. It's, uh, it feels like it could really, it's not quite there where it needs to be, but it's, it's getting there. So Cartoon Network always kind of knocks me out with some of these random cartoons that I'm not really sure about at first, like, like, uh, Adventure Time. Like, the very first time I watched Finn and Jake, I was like, this is just really weird. (laughs) Actually, it was my son who watched Finn and Jake, and I'm like, what in the world are you watching on TV right now? Like, seriously, there's a stretching dog and a a kid with a so I have, I have no idea what's going on. But as you watched it, it became a story, it developed, and it had a lot of backstory. And I think after season one, because season one, again, I do not think had a lot, a lot of content. It did have content, but I don't think it had a lot of content. I think it was more of like one of those uh, sketch shows, you know, where you kind of do something in this episode, then you do something in this episode, and it doesn't really carry on. Like, it would have been like uh, in South Park, where Kenny dies, and then you just mm-hmm. you continue on. That's what it was like in the first season. And then the second season, you actually started getting this development where Rick started making everybody else change. And you could see the change in them. Like, even Jerry, who is, like, a back-back character who shouldn't have, like, a lot of screen time because he's, you know, he's the dad who is not really a part of the show. Well, they always have that subplot in there, or this hinting at subplot where it's that they're struggling marriage and all that with, uh... Him and his wife. Right. And that's always... That's Rick. Rick is the one putting that wedge in there. And he, he kind of, just at the end of that season, two, he's like, uh, you choose me or you choose uh, Rick. And she definitely chooses Rick. And you can see that, how Rick affects every little thing he comes into contact with. And and it's not only through these crazy inventions like the Meeseeks. It's not only... Through, like, the flu bug with the Cronenberg episode. And it's, it's not only through, like, the neutrino bomb. It, it's not only through those inventions that he makes, but it's through who he is as a person makes everybody else different. Like, when we first started, uh, Morty's sister didn't have really much anything. She was on her phone. She didn't really care. Whatever, whatever, whatever. And all of a sudden, you know, by ep- our season two, now she's wanting to be with Rick and Morty all the time, and you can see that jealousy, you can see that uh, Rick is changing who she is as a person because she's wanting to have that fun that Morty's having, and you can see the the change in that, and you can definitely see the change in Beth, you can see the change in Jerry, you could definitely see the change in Morty, who was like this scared... Morty's breaking. <laughs> right, Morty yeah. is going to go postal and and that's the one of the reasons why I think that possibly it could be the original Morty. Because did Rick finally send him over the edge? And he just decided, you know, with all these adventures that he goes on, Morty starts getting smarter. And it's, like, really subtle. 
he'll do things as like you know where he detonated the bomb during the superhero episode. Or where he, sorry, he clipped the wires and it kept it from detonating. Uh, he defused the bomb. And so he's like, are you sure you could do that? And he's like, I've done it a hundred times. And so <laughs> he's he's talking about how he's developing this. And is he going to be smarter than Rick at the end? Because Rick has taught him everything he knows. And Rick doesn't even realize that he built up. And he created Evil Morty. That would have been, I mean, it would probably be pretty cool to see as a, as an end-all, be-all. And I'm sure that the creators of this have an end in mind. Uh, I think that they do. They've uh, uh, they've talked about it. I think that they have an idea. They're just very, very... Uh, they have a lot of trouble getting there. Like, which is why they usually take a year between. And all the time, they constantly say, like, this is going to be the season where we have, like, 14 episodes. This is going to be the season with 13 episodes. And they're like, well, we didn't do that. Well, I love the tidbit of information that I didn't know that you told me after I watched the Meeseeks episode which is only like episode four. And you're yeah. like, they just ran out of ideas. How do you run out of ideas <laughs> in episode four of season one? And uh, the guy that created it, I think it's Dana Harmon. Like, I don't remember. I don't think this was uh, the uh, voice actor of Rick and Morty saying this because he also worked on a show called Community. And he was talking about it and he said, like, I want to show them with season four that I'm capable of taking on more episodes, more responsibility. So he says this time around, he's going to make sure that he gets 14 episodes for season four. And I believe this is like, I believe in community, he got fired after, uh, by the fourth season. And he's like, this is going to be my chance. And, um, I, I didn't watch community, so I couldn't tell you. I've, I have people that have watched community who really, really like it. And like, I haven't watched it either myself. So, I, I, yeah, I don't really know much about the director's backstory uh, with Community or anything like that. I just know that I thought it was funny in episode four already, you're out of content ideas. I, they made it ten episodes. I, I mean, well, ne not necessarily. Uh, maybe they weren't out of, like, maybe they needed wrote, a filler. Like, wrote four episodes and wrote four episodes and they needed two episodes in between or something like that. Where right, like a little filler wrote, episode. So, yeah. if we go on to the next question, what... If you had to pick, I know that you said that you don't have a favorite episode, but let's say that gun to your head, you're going to die if you don't pick a favorite episode. What is it? It's it's difficult. It's it's gun to your head, like. Uh, but like, what what my I always think to, and I remember whenever I watched it with my girlfriend, I asked her what her favorite, I mean, what her least favorite episode was, and she was like the, uh, the flu the flu dance episode, and. I'm like, I think that was like, because I really like that moment at the end. I really, it really made something for me where I'm like, oh, wow, that is a really, really cool thing that they just did. And the follow up to it's really good. And, but also. I like how they go back to the world later on too. It's not just forgotten. Like yeah. they actually do go back there whenever they're looking to free, uh, in the season three, I believe when they're looking to free, uh, Rick from prison. And I enjoyed the Scary Terry episode, but I don't, like, I don't put it up there. Like, it was just, it's amusing to me because I'm like, hey, it's Freddy Krueger, but not Freddy Krueger. And that's kind of cool. And then it has, like, Inception undertones with it. Uh, I'm thinking maybe it's the end of season two. And, like, and it feels like it's mostly, just like that uh, with the prom episode, it's mostly because of the end and how it, like... Enough tiny world! <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I like the end of season two. That is a great episode. Episode of season first episode of season one is also it, it it's amazing. Like the action in that, the idea of it, it's just really good. But I cannot cannot get over the fact that Pickle Rick is the best episode. And I know that you said that you didn't think the Pickle Rick was a standout episode, but I love I, Pickle Rick. Like, I think it was just them, like, it was good, It was just, and it was funny, it's just like... I just love... Let's do something goes, really, goes, really silly. He goes, why did you hurt yourself into a pickle? <laughs> because I can! Oh, but I can't understand why anybody would want to do that. Because they can't. <laughs> he's, got, he's got that, and you find out it's not because he wanted to turn himself into a pickle but all because he didn't want to go to family therapy. Like, that's how much he hated family therapy, is that he'd rather be a pickle. That's a, that is a, it's a good episode, like I said. And I also love how, like, he just all of a sudden, and 
he just turns into a karate kung fu master by ripping these rats in half and putting them on a pickle. I mean, how is that not... Using his, like, tongue on their brain to, like, <laughs> yeah. make the maneuver. He makes a cockroach and he's, like, using it as, like, a, a board to get to the next. And he's, like, killing all these rats and he's building this machine. And all of a sudden, he goes into the Russian mob's little <laughs> headquarters. And how is that not the funniest thing? They used to tell a story about a pickle. <laughs> okay. I'm like, what the heck? So, I mean, it was it was totally different. It was really funny. Um, it had the kind of the undertones of a Robert Rodriguez movie is what it was. It was a really cheesy machete is what it was. It was machete in pickle form. That was what machete would have been if machete had been a pickle. And it was hilarious, unlike Machete, which was just a horrible movie. Machete was not a horrible movie. Machete was pretty It was, it was by no means a good movie. It was entertaining. And so was, and honestly, everyone hated, uh, people liked the first Machete, or like, they, they're mixed. It was like, I believe. I don't know like if I ever watched any of it. Was there more? There was Machete Returns. <laughs> or, no, Machete Kills. Uh, I didn't even know there was more. Machete I just knew kills. there was the first one. And Machete Kills, I think, I think that's the one that had Mel Gibson in it. Uh... And you know when you're scraping for the bottom of the barrel when you get Mel Gibson. <laughs> yeah. For freedom! Yeah. Uh, hey, Braveheart yeah. was a really good movie. That was. Like, the whole Jew thing probably wasn't his most proud moment. Do you, you, know, you know Ricky Gervais. You're a big fan of him, too, I assume. Yeah, I like but, Ricky yeah. Gervais. Uh, oh, I remember at the Golden Globes, he's like, I always make fun of Rick Einer. I always make fun of Mel Gibson. So now I'm at this awkward point where I... Uh, to introduce do the introductions for this Golden Globe Award, he's like personally, I blame the Golden uh, Golden Globes for this, and Mel Gibson blames. Well, we all know who Mel Gibson <laughs> Gibson blames. I love how Mel Gibson like came out and said that he wasn't racist, and then like turned around and said like a Jew joke in the middle of the same <laughs> interview. It's uh, like I don't know that that's how you do that. Well, but dum dum dum. So getting back on track, uh. uh is there anything you think that they could improve with Rick and Morty going forward? So whenever I watched the first step, our first season, sorry, I would have I would have definitely said yes. Uh, second season, I mean, there was there was a, I think it was a really good season. I, we could have probably compounded on it by a little bit more character development, but really it is what it is, and I liked it. Season three, I don't think that there's really much they could have done different to make me like it anymore except for switching out that episode i really do not like how they ended it on president versus morty i or rick i i just don't think that it was impactful enough i don't think that we ended on a good note i'm not as excited i am excited but i'm not as excited for season four as i was for season three like season two's ending was like i need to see season three like that was a really good ending season uh, three ended, and I was like, well, if they ended it after the Evil Morty episode, I would have been like, wow, that was really good. I wonder what's going to happen next. But then they did two other episodes, and nothing was said about it. So, like, Rick didn't even acknowledge that there had been a Morty uh, elected president of all the other Ricks, and Morty didn't even... I mean, like, Morty probably didn't know, honestly. But it wasn't touched upon again. And I, I feel like sometimes some of the stories go a long time without being touched upon again. And that could be a problem. So, like, touching on those stories at least a little bit to remind us that they exist. So you think that it should have a tighter narrative? Like, it should have more I don't want, like I don't want to, like, expunge the entire idea of the sketch because, like, I do like that they have improv. I, I love that. So I don't want to expunge that. But I think that touching on it or, like, showing that it exists. Like, even if they have, like, little bitty things where, like, Rick maybe was, like, reading the newspaper and it's like, Oh, crap. And, like, throws it away. And then the episode goes. And that would be fun. I just, I, I think that they need to acknowledge that, that that happened before moving on to the next. Well, I think that if I had something I would change, it's, I would say that it needs to be more cohesive going forward. But I think that at the same time, I think it's headed. I think I'm very optimistic of where it's headed, and I think that it's going to do what I want it to do. And I feel confident in that regard. You brought up South Park at one point, which is not necessarily because they're comparable. I guess they both kind of have a uh, zesty, all-over-the-place kind of humor. But at one point recently, South Park did this episode where they had Mr. Garrison run for president, and there were these uh, 
these berries that were brainwashing people. And the thing is, this this overarching story carried on for that entire season. Like, it was the best South Park has ever done. And South, uh, South Park as a whole is relatively hit or miss. But in that season, like, it had such a strong, focused narrative. And I would like to see Rick and Morty going forward at least once or twice just to see what it'd be like. I'd like to see him, like, not necessarily get rid of the sketch, uh, sketchy uh, way it approaches things, but I'd like it to have, like, every episode build toward it, like, one big narrative. Maybe, like, the Indian season. Like, the Indian season, like, a blow-off, like, a big shebang, you know, to get that out there into the world. It depends. It might, maybe we'll have an ending season. Maybe it'll be, like, a South Park and go for... Just go forever. Go for, like, I believe they're on season 25 now? Yeah, I don't think so. Simpsons is ever ending, ever. And, yeah. Uh, it keeps on, like, I've heard about it being canceled, like, three times, and then I, it just keeps on going. I'm like, I thought that was canceled. And they're like, eh, nah, no, mm. never mind. <laughs> like, <laughs> we've changed our mind. We're just going to keep on going. For how long? Forever. Forever. After all this time? Always. <laughs> That's our Harry Potter reference for this podcast. I knew I had to get it in there somewhere, so there it was. So... Like, my last question about this, and, and I think that Rick and Morty has a lot of shocking moments. And I don't mean shocking as in, like, I didn't expect it to happen. I mean shocking as in, like, that was really something I did not expect to see in this show. Or something I did not expect to see in a cartoon. And I understand that Rick and Morty is an adult cult cartoon, so you see a lot of stuff you may not expect in a cartoon. But I didn't even expect it to go this far. Uh, do you have a moment that you didn't expect it to go this far? I can't single out one right at the second, can you? I can't. So there was an episode where uh, Rick and Morty are leaving, and Summer is left in the spaceship, and Morty leaves, or Rick leaves it with the directions to protect Summer. And then they go into the battery. You remember that episode? Where they yeah, go into the battery, yeah. and that's like it's a battery in Inception. Like, oh, it's a battery within a battery within a battery within mm-hmm. a battery. Yeah. So during that episode... Like, the SWAT team comes, and everything's coming on, and the spaceship does, or Summer doesn't want the spaceship to use force. So, instead of killing, because they kill, like, those two just random people, so you're like, okay, that's a little grotesque, but that's not so bad. I expected to see that in Rick and Morty. That's not that big of a deal. What I didn't expect is, whenever they go to the mental warfare, and they're like, so, I can't (laughs) kill them. And they're like, no. And so, he, like, shoots out that little pod, and the little boy comes up. And then he shows him his little boy dying again. Like, that is harsh. Like, how in the world? Like, that's something I did not expect to see. Like, you're throwing a little kid. And it's like, you know that little kid died of, like, cancer or something. And, like, you're showing the dad that all of a sudden it's melting away again. And the ship's like, don't fuck with me. And you're like, wow. <laughs> you're like, I did not expect to see that at all. Wow. And so that is my most shocking moment. That's something that I did not expect to see, did not expect to come out. It definitely it definitely has a more carefree, it goes in places, which uh, it seems relatively new, but this is not something that's really new for Comedy Central. Comedy Central's uh, known for like being willing to go places that uh, most mainstream uh, channels aren't willing to go. Like, South Park's gone in some places like that. Uh, the Jelly Bean. <laughs> the Jelly Bean episode where they go, that's uh, Morty's first uh, adventure that, that Rick allows him to go on. That's the one where they make the bet where if uh, Morty wins every 10th uh, adventure they go on, Morty gets to pick it. Well, uh, he takes him to like the, the candy land or whatever, and the, and the Jelly Bean, who ends up being the king, tries to rape him in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, that, that is pretty grotesque and weird. Like You didn't expect to see... You know, a pedophile jelly bean trying to rape Morty. Like, that kind of caught me off a little bit as well. Like, I remember when South Park, uh, like, they had whenever Mr. Garrison had that sex change to become Mrs. Garrison, they showed the actual sex change on the show. Like, they actually showed a surgery being done, like, the footage and everything of someone, like, <laughs> they're like, first we tuck the scrotum down, and like, do some slices here. Yeah, that's so, I mean, yeah. it's probably not as grotesque as South Park, I mean, yeah. honestly, like, it, but, but it's, I just didn't expect to see it. Yeah. And, and it, it caught me off guard. It was a lot different than what I thought was going to happen. Like, the, I don't know, you don't usually expect for kids to be used. Like, even in, like, horror movies, you don't see a lot of kids die. It's like... 
that's like the unwritten rule is you don't kill kids, which yeah. was why like at the ending of like Star Wars Episode Three, it the movie wasn't great, but the the overall idea was awesome. And then Anakin going in there and killing the kids, you were like, wow, well, he is he is evil. Like he killed those kids. Like yeah, you definitely have like uh, kids have this imposed armor that it's like it's always surprising. Like I remember whenever I watched the new It movie. There's a scene where Georgie's talking to uh, Pennywise, and whenever, like, Georgie comes down to reach for the balloon, I was so surprised, like, whenever I was in the theater, because, like, the clown just goes up and bites his arm off, and it's, like, it doesn't, like, uh, cut away like you expect, like, you can see the blood, like, dripping out of his arm, and it's, like, severed, and, like, he tries to crawl away, and he uses his, like, nub to try to crawl away from it, and I'm like, holy shit. So, I think the unwritten rule is, you don't yeah. kill... Kids, you don't kill animals. Yeah. And, and then, you know, Pet Cemetery just does it both. So, <laughs> <laughs> you got Stephen King who just does whatever yeah. he wants. So, really, that is where I could end the conversation in Rick and Morty. I think it is a great show. I think it is going to build up into an even better show. Season 4 is looking really good. I think that Season 3 was great. Um, do you have anything else to add to the... I would, I would say that... I went into it with very, very high expectations. People have been selling at me on it for a long, long time. And I went into it with, like, I thought it was going to be fantastic. And while it is very, very good, I don't think that it has yet become what I'd call great. It's something that is very, very entertaining. I'd put it up with... I, like, I constantly find myself in my head comparing it to Futurama. That's the one I always uh, uh, find myself comparing it to, maybe because of all the... Uh, science fiction aspects into it. Uh, I also love Futurama, so we're gonna go okay. And I think that, like, with Futurama, there there were a lot of episodes that were very, very miss, especially in the later seasons. It became more miss than wins at that point. But there was a lot of great episodes. Like, we always, I think we, in the last episode we mentioned, or last Mishmash podcast we did, we talked about Fry and his dog, and that episode, that episode was great. That, uh, and I think that there's been a lot of very good episodes from Rick and Morty, but I don't think that, in summary, I've ever had a moment where I'm like, that was just great, that was a great, great thing that they did, and it was followed up great, and everything about it was great. And I think that season four is what I'm in, like, I think that season four is going to achieve that. I think that we've been building to it, and now this is the payoff, or we're not, not necessarily the payoff, but I think that we're coming into our own and it's going to have a stronger season four than what we've seen in the three seasons prior, which weren't bad at all. Just, I think it's going to be really, really good. So last question to wrap this up, a rating from one to 10. Oh crap. Putting Uh, you on the spot, rating one to 10. 7.5. 7.5 from Nick. And I'm going to say that it is about an 8.8. And I'm going to say that, because I think season one brings it down. If I just had to rate season two and season three, I'd probably say it's about a 9.3. So that's what we're going to end it on. 8.8 for me. 7.5 for Nick. And uh, this is Pickle Rick signing off.